sleep, perchance to dream. Ay, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time? The oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contemplate, the pangs of despised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes when he himself might his quietus make with a bare bodkin. Who would fardels bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life but that the dread of something after death? discovered country from whose born no traveller returns, puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. So, Prince Hamlet, when the ghost of your father instructed you to take revenge on your uncle who murdered him and married your mother and seized the throne of Denmark, how much did that event impair your normal functioning on a scale of one to four? If somebody is thought to be definitely not in their right mind, whatever that means, then a lot of people think that makes it okay to take away some of their rights, like by locking them up in a psych ward, for instance. So morally, legally, and medically, a heck of a lot is riding on this question of how we decide what a mental illness is and when, if, that kind of response is okay. And it's kind of alarmingly unclear where that line is or if it even exists. And one of the best ways of illustrating this is to learn about something that used to be considered a mental illness and is no longer. The American Psychiatric Association officially thought that homosexuality was a mental illness until 1973, which might seem like the distant past but really isn't that long ago. And when they did declassify it, a counter-narrative sprang up saying that they'd been pressured into it by activist gays who denied scientific evidence in favour of political ideology. That story might sound familiar to some of you. So why did people used to think that homosexuality was a mental illness? What were their rationalisations? Well, Sigmund Freud thought, wrongly, that homosexuality could be traced to some kind of abnormal experience in childhood. And although he later changed his mind about it being a mental illness, the idea that there must be something screwy going on in the heads of people who aren't straight and that it was all linked to childhood stuck. The hallmark of an illness that's often used for defining them is that it inhibits normal function. <laughs> And in the 50s and 60s, people like Sandor Rado and Irving Bieber started to say that in their findings, and they did scientific tests that they really believed in, gay and lesbian and bisexual people seemed pretty dysfunctional, and they thought they could cure them and make them happier and turn them into straight people through therapy, and that it was all a matter of bad parenting. There's the Freudian legacy. The problem, or one of the many problems, was that Freud and a lot of the thinkers who came after him only ever spoke to gay and lesbian and bisexual people who were in therapy already, and ignored all the ones who weren't, who were functioning fine. But these ideas gained a lot of power to make people feel ashamed of themselves and make those around them, especially parents, feel like they'd done something wrong. In 1956, Dr. Evelyn Hooker conducted an actual scientific study with a control group and she found that the gay men she investigated weren't really any more dysfunctional than straight men, but her work was covered up. The Nixon administration later got wind of it and tried to bury it on political grounds. So ironically, politics really was holding back the science, but just the other way. And tempting as it is to lay the blame for society-wide homophobia solely at the feet of religious authorities like Reverend Jerry Farwell, who definitely played their part, academics and doctors were in on it too, from the very beginning. And that's how it happened. Entire sexualities became medicalized. And then that diagnosis was used to justify taking away people's rights and talking over them because they're mentally ill, so therefore they don't know what's best for them. The problems start to creep in because inhibiting normal function requires you to define normal. And I definitely don't want to piss on anyone's chips, especially if psychiatry has been a help to you, but the philosophical concern is that psychiatrists' own conceptions of what counts as a normal good life can creep into their judgment of who is deviant and therefore ill. 
especially if psychiatrists themselves aren't a very diverse bunch. Health can't really be defined without reference to some theory of a good human life, and one definition doesn't always fit everybody. Okay, I'm going to ask you some standard questions now that will help us determine what sort of a service we think you might be right for. Over the last two weeks, how often have you been bothered by any of the following to the extent that they've impaired your normal function on a scale of one to four, one being not at all and four being every day? Little interest or pleasure in doing things you would normally enjoy. Feeling down, depressed, or hopeless. Trouble sleeping or eating. Sleeping or eating too much or too little. Feeling that you are a failure and have let your family down. Just on a scale of one to four. The problem of defining the boundaries of health and disease isn't just an issue for psychiatry, but all medicine. For instance, you may have heard of the Jehovah's Witnesses. They're a denomination of Christians, and a very small part of their belief system is they don't think Christians should get blood transfusions. And as you can imagine, it doesn't come up very often for them, because most people never get a blood transfusion, and most people think that you don't have to get a medical treatment if you don't want one, most of the time. There's a big exception to that, which we're coming to shortly. But most people at least agree that you don't have to get a blood transfusion if you don't want one. So, Jehovah's Witnesses, you do you. But what do you do if a child of Jehovah's Witnesses, not yet old enough to make an informed religious and medical decision, needs a transfusion or they're gonna die? In that case, you can't get around the fact that somebody, be they a doctor or a judge, is gonna have to make a moral call between valuing the religious rights of the parents or valuing the life of the child. In my country, this has actually happened, and the High Court said that doctors are allowed to give blood transfusions against parents' wishes if it is medically necessary. Trouble is, though, that medical decision contains within it a moral and even a religious one about what is good for the child and who gets to decide that. The opinion of the High Court is, oh, we put morality and religion to one side and we just focus on the medicine. But by pretending to do that impossible thing, you actually make a moral and religious decision. There are no morally neutral medical calls, and every medical treatment presupposes that there is in fact a problem of a particular nature. Although we think a lot of the time that medical treatments should be voluntary, practically speaking, the big exception people make often comes with mental illness. Interestingly, although suicide is technically legal in my country, if you get caught attempting it, you can be arrested, as in handcuffs, threatened by the cops, strip-searched, and thrown in the back of an ambulance. You can be imprisoned in a psych ward if you are a danger to yourself, even though being a danger to yourself is a legal thing to be. And many of those who have been sectioned under the Mental Health Act in my country describe appalling conditions that are much more like punishment than they are like care. An independent review published in 2018 reports that two-thirds of people sectioned in my country say they were not treated with dignity and respect. It's also worth noting that black Britons are four times as likely to be sectioned as whites, so race might be creeping into people's assessments of what counts as normal and healthy too. In his book Fatal Freedom, libertarian philosopher Thomas Zaz gives a history of how suicide became medicalized. In my country, it was illegal to kill yourself until 1961. Long before that, it used to be that if you killed yourself, all your property would be confiscated and go to the state. And around about the 19th century, people started to think that that was pretty cruel especially on families who were left behind, who were basically being punished for somebody else's crime. So lawyers started to use the insanity defense and say that if you killed yourself, you must be insane and therefore weren't criminally responsible. It was a legal dodge to allow families to keep their dead relatives' property. And then religious authorities got in on it as well. Previously, a lot of them had said that suicides couldn't receive certain rights or burials because it was a sin. And then they also started using the ipso facto insane defense. And that's why we today view suicide predominantly through the lens of insanity and therefore medicine. Whereas a lot of other cultures and peoples at different times just haven't seen it like that. Вышел из корабля Алексей Леонов. 
Человек в межпланетном пространстве. Now we talked before about how homosexuality and bisexuality became medicalized into mental illnesses, and then after a turbulent political struggle, things changed. And the reason that might sound familiar is that right now we are doing that whole dance again, but with trans people. In particular, some transphobes point to the higher suicide rate amongst trans people as proof that it must be some kind of dysfunction, just like they did in the 50s and 60s for homosexuality and bisexuality. Because the suicide rate for LGBT people is higher than for others. So if we can establish that suicidality isn't always a sign of insanity, mental illness or dysfunction, then we'll be doing LGBT folks a massive solid by taking that ammo away from their persecutors. We'll presumably also be doing a lot of people a solid because they might then be more open to talking about how they feel. Thoughts about ending your own life? or feeling that you would be better off dead. But that's no easy task, partly because we've been medicalizing suicide for hundreds of years, and partly because if not all suicides are the result of mental dysfunction, then that means that people who are perfectly in their right minds can rationally decide to kill themselves. And that's a pretty bleak thing to have to face for two big reasons I can think of. Firstly, even if 99 out of 100 suicides are the result of uncontrollable mental illness, like just a bolt from the blue, if it's your mother, or it's your brother, or it's your lover, and you're the one who's left behind, you're of course gonna ask yourself, what if that was the one? What if it wasn't an uncontrollable mental storm, but what if it was a decision that they made in the moment based on certain factors in their life, and therefore what if I could have done something about it? Like what, if, what if I called them? What if I texted them? What was the last thing I said? Could I have saved them? And that line of thinking is truly the fucking depths of human experience. I've been close to people who've fallen into that. And you can spend your whole life asking what if questions again and again that you can never find the answers to. The idea that suicide is in its own bubble, it's like cancer, it just boom happens and no one can do anything about it. That's an enormous comfort to a lot of people and it's gonna be really difficult to let go of that. Secondly, if suicide is something that, for want of a better word, rational people can decide to do, then, yeah, there is no nice way of putting this, actually. Uh, that means that it's an option. If it's not something that we can just sweep under the rug and say, oh, only mad people think about that, then this discussion is going to force us to confront the question, do I want to go on living? And that's not really a question that uh, a lot of people find it enjoyable to contemplate. I mean, like, do I, do I want to go on living? I mean, I don't even know what I'm having for my dinner tonight. <laughs> you know? I don't really want to think about that. I know this is a philosophy channel, but sometimes it really is easy to just not think about stuff. Some philosophers have argued that because suicide is the choice between life and death, where one of those options is a complete unknown, it must be irrational because you can't make an informed decision. And this is the same argument that Hamlet makes. Could I have my stationery holder back? No. But the response to that is that we're not really choosing between life and death. Yes, death is an unknown, but life is a known quantity, and to the suicidal person in the moment, it's judged to be negative. So really, it's just a choice between different amounts of life. And at least some suicidal people don't really want to die per se. They're just in a lot of emotional pain and don't have any other way of stopping it. I know that mental health and even just suicidality is an enormously varied field. But I don't think we can say that every suicidal impulse, whether it results in death or not, 
is necessarily a sign of insanity. During the siege of Masada in 74 AD, a Roman legion surrounded the mountain fortress of Masada, trapping the Jewish rebels inside. When they got in there, they found the rebels had all killed each other rather than be taken captive. The Jews of Masada basically died by suicide. And I don't think it's reasonable to say that in circumstances like that, everybody suddenly came down with the same mental illness. No, the Jews of Masada died because of their beliefs. And they weren't delusional either. They really were surrounded, facing a shitty life of slavery, and they decided that they'd rather be dead. Why are we talking about the Jews of Masada? Because, Dr. Rosencrantz, I don't want to talk about myself. Again, definitely not trying to minimize the ability of psychiatry and medicine to save people's lives, but the philosophical question here is, can we talk about mental illness in exclusively medical terms? Because doctors in my country have started talking about people with SLS, shit life syndrome. And it's obviously not a medical condition, but people who work crap, precarious jobs, who aren't being paid enough, who can't make rent, who live in filthy, depressing cities, or they get discriminated against, or they, you know, you live in a country where everything's getting worse all the time and nobody in charge knows what they're doing, and they're like, all just blinding assholes. Or you love someone and they die, or you love someone and they hurt you really bad. Like, <laughs> those things can impair your normal function a bit like a disease can. In his book, Capitalist Realism, Mark Fisher writes, it goes without saying that all mental illnesses are neurologically instantiated, but this says nothing about their causation. If it is true, for instance, that depression is constituted by low serotonin levels, what still needs to be explained is why particular individuals have low levels of serotonin. By privatizing these problems, treating them as if they were caused only by chemical imbalances in the individual's neurology and or by their family background, any question of social, systemic causation is ruled out. Mark killed himself in 2017. The philosopher Franz Fanon was a psychiatrist treating Algerian torture survivors during the French occupation, and he realised that there was no point making them better when the main problem in their lives, the fact that the French were occupying their country and torturing them, was still there. There's no point making them better if you're just going to send them out into the world and it's going to mess them up again. So he resigned his post and he joined the revolutionaries. Right. Or what about Thich Wang Duc, the Buddhist monk in 1963 who set himself on fire to protest the South Vietnamese government's treatment of Buddhists. He left a note to be read after he died saying, I respectfully plead to President No Din Diem to take a mind of compassion towards the people of the nation and implement religious equality. And that, that doesn't sound like a guy who's out of his mind. Mate, you can't you can't do a video about how suicidality isn't necessarily a sign of insanity and only provide historical examples of people who actually killed themselves. It undermines your point. You have to tell them about somebody who tried to kill themselves and who isn't insane and who is still alive. You have to tell them what that's like. My first suicide attempt, or suicidal gesture, whatever, we want, whatever you want to call it, uh, was when I was 17. I was upset, obviously, about a lot of things. I don't want to oversimplify it. Yeah, I just didn't see a way out. My second attempt was in February of 2018. And again, I was uh, obviously very upset. Uh, I wasn't in a good place. Uh, I didn't feel safe. I felt very trapped. In the end, I, um, I called the Samaritans. They're a crisis line here in the UK and uh, they just listen to you. They, they don't give you any advice or tell you what to do. And they don't have the power to you know, lock you up or report you or anything. So I spoke to Andrea was the volunteer's name for about 45 minutes and I told her everything I'd been through and she was like, yeah, that sounds real shit. <laughs> as far as I know, there's no history of mental illness in my family. I do have a history of self-harm, uh, though I've been good for a few years now. When I started out, I always used to... Um, 
always used to use the, the same knife. This one. Uh, and I, I realize that it's probably quite disturbing for you to actually see it. And, and believe me, it's pretty disturbing for me to hold it again. But uh, the reason I brought it is, do you want to see something funny? <laughs> it has a fork and a spoon attachment on it. Like, you can even... Like, <laughs> what, what better illustration of the, the auto-cannibalistic nature of self-harm, the, the nourishing of the self through the destruction of the self? Like, what, what better illustration of that could you possibly ask for than the fact that the knife that I literally used to use to cut my own skin actually has cutlery on it. <laughs> you, you have my permission to laugh with me on that. Like, that is actually kind of funny. The thing is, I'm high functioning. I function like a machine. In four years of uni, I never missed class. In six years of YouTube, I've missed my upload date once. I, I just function, I'm there, I get it done. Like, I'm, and I'm, I'm lucky by that, you know. I'm, I'm a man, uh, I'm English, so, you know, emotional repression's part of the deal. And uh, I was an army cadet for most of my teenage years, so I've been socialized and trained to function under fire, like both metaphorical fire and literal fire. <laughs> I function, even if I'm just absolutely drowning inside. Under functioning, actually helps. A lot's been said recently about YouTubers facing burnout and the, the pressure of having to pretend to be happy when really things aren't so happy. So I should probably say that what I was going through in February had nothing to do with that. In fact, at the time YouTube was a, was a pretty welcome escape and I enjoyed it. I still enjoy it. Anyway, the point is my suicidal tendencies don't fit the normal pattern of what is thought to be an illness because they don't really impair my normal functioning. My desire to murder and mutilate myself is, it's kind of always there. I think about it, not all the time, but usually every day. So it doesn't impair my normal functioning because my normal functioning is itself an act of impairment from, on, on that. <laughs> like, I went to the doctor, and uh, I told her what had happened, and the whole shebang. And uh, she put me on the waiting list to see a therapist. A six month waiting list. Two suicide attempts, six months before you can talk to anyone about it. That is what austerity and cuts to mental health have done in my country. That's the social and systemic causation that Fisher is talking about. And now um, I, I get two half-hour sessions of therapy a month over the phone. Uh, it's early days. Yeah, I've only had two sessions at time of recording, but just things in my life have kind of improved, so I'm starting to feel a little bit better. Whenever I feel like hurting myself now, or, or killing myself now, I imagine that I'm a cosmonaut. That's why I'm dressed like this. I imagine that I'm one of those old Soviet-era spacemen, like Yuri Gagarin or Alexei Leonov, because that's what it feels like. It feels like being stuck in a tiny, hot, cramped spacecraft, and and I don't, I don't want to go because it's scary up there, but you don't have a choice. Because you get put in it and it shakes and it shakes and then blast off, off you go. I'm just spinning through the atmosphere, skipping across it like a stone, just everything's shaking and banging my head off the sides and the spacecraft's coming apart because it ain't fit to fly. Toxic masculinity's a hell of a ship to pilot when you're suffering. But I'm just trying to repair it like mid-flight as it goes. 
with gaffer tape and string and there's no radio communication, just cut out, just no, no message from Earth, just go. Just thousands of pounds of thrust behind it. And it, it's so stupid, it can happen like when I should be happy, when I could be somewhere just filled with love and joy and then suddenly one little thing happens and bang, nine Gs, zero gravity, off you go. Just hurtling through space with just like tin foil, nothing between me and just void. And I've got to keep my spacesuit on and keep it sealed up tight because the vacuum is just pulling. But I know, I know that if I can just be brave and hang on, that I can get through it and I can land the thing and I can come back down to Earth. I can see the earth again because I want to I want to live <laughs> I am the cosmodor <laughs> how do you tell when someone's in their right mind and how do you tell what is a disease and what is just someone responding to the world which can often impair our normal function. Thomas Zaz, he takes the libertarian position. He says that suicide should never be interfered with. He says that just as we have a right to birth control because of bodily autonomy, so too must we have a right to death control. He says that suicide can sometimes be rational and therefore it's not okay to de facto treat it like it's not. And he says this because he cares about what happens to suicidal people and he wants their rights to be respected. And that's a noble goal and it's one that I share, but I still think he's coming at this from the wrong direction because I know that there are times when I, when I just want to die. And I also know that right now isn't one of them. So I'm in a bit of a conundrum. I've got conflicting desires. Which desire should I act on, Mr. Zaz, if I want to maximize my autonomy? What's the rational thing to do here? Live or kill myself? To be or not to be? That is the question. But I don't think Hamlet's question can be answered. I don't think it's about whether suicide is rational. I think it's about whether it's understandable. Can we empathize with someone who just wants to die. And surely that is the beginning of designing policies and institutions and behaviours that give suicidal people the help they think they need on their terms. The help we think we need on our terms. And now, if you're out there, if you're out there in space and you've made it to the end of this video, and you're thinking about killing yourself, then there's only one thing I want to say to you. And by all means, listen to doctors and psychiatrists and professional help if you think you need it and you can get it. Listen to loved ones. Listen to the people who tell you what happens to your loved ones if you leave them behind. Listen to the people who tell you what can happen to you if you try it and don't die. I've, I've seen debate online about whether it's actually helpful to just post numbers to suicide hotlines. I see both sides of it. The Samaritans helped me. So I'll put a whole bunch of numbers down there just in case. But if you're out there and you're drifting in space, the one thing that I want to tell you, the one just little transmission from my spacecraft to yours, is just the thing that I wish someone had been there to tell me those two nights when I tried it. It's the simplest and it's the most powerful phrase in the English language, I think. I understand how you feel. I've been up there. <laughs> I've flown that mission. I fly it a hell of a lot. <laughs> and you're not necessarily bad or broken inside just because they're sending you up. So you fly safe, cosmonauts. And I don't want to end the video by saying the end because the mission goes on. So instead, 
I'll just say. And I think it's gonna be a long, long time till touchdown brings me around again to find I'm not the man they think I am at home. Oh no, no, no. I'm a rocket man. Rocket man burning down his fuse out here. It's gonna be a long, long time Till touchdown brings me round I get to find I'm not the man they think I am at home Oh no, no, no I'm a rocket man Rocket man Burning down his fuels out here alone Mars ain't the kind of place to raise your kids In fact, it's cold as hell And there's no one there to raise them If you did And all the science I don't understand It's just my job, five days a week A rocket man Rocket man And I think it's gonna be a long, long time Till touchdown brings me round again to find I'm not the man Yes, I think that